Hello and welcome to this very special edition, the one that you always look for. It's the last one of the year where we recap the stories, the top stories of the past year. And hello and welcome to this show. And uh, we have, since you know that it's the last one, we're going to recap the top 10 and hopefully we'll have time for them because, I mean, there's one. We don't know which one is going to be the, the top one. And Kieran Clark and Fred Alberto. It's, it's a real mystery. Real mystery. I don't know what it is, but hopefully we'll have time to talk about it because we have a lot, a lot. But anyway, every special edition, we have to bring reinforcements in. It's already here. Mr. Kieran Clark, the European golf guru, is with us to also help us count down the top 10 stories of 2020. Kieran, I think we off uh, of... Uh, being live, we agreed we want to get done with 2020. What, what do you think? I think so. I think, uh, Carlos, it's been a year that obviously none of us will ever forget. I mean, the pandemic obviously has impacted all of our lives. And we discussed before recording the show tonight that I think this event we've seen this year has been so unique because it has li quite literally touched every person on earth, every nation, every country, every industry has been impacted. And that's something that we've never really seen in living memory and that's why this ongoing event which it still is uh, will be something that we will be reckoning with for many years to come it's something that will be studied in the history books for decades and even centuries in the future so but yes there was plenty of golf this year and we can be grateful for that carlos because um as i say the, the pandemic has impacted everybody and every industry including the world of golf but we can be grateful i think uh, that despite the disruption, which we'll discuss later, uh, we still had some fantastic and magnificent stories and victories to reflect upon. And I can't wait to discuss all those tonight and review them with you and Fred. Um, obviously, you said there we have this as a, as a top 10, but we could have easily, I think, done a top 25. But if that was the case, the show would go on forever and I would like to get to my bed at some point. So let's go. Yeah, for all of you that don't know, that still don't know, I know everybody knows, but Kieran Clark is in the home of golf in Scotland, okay? So that's why he needs to go to sleep. So we'll try to keep it short for you, <laughs> three hours at least. Uh, oh, no yeah. We'll, we'll the thing that. is, Carlos, you know, usually it's my fault that the show runs too long. I'm my own, I'm my own worst enemy, so that's, I talk too much. <laughs> <laughs> we'll see. But let's bring directly from the Ohio State University, okay, Fred Alvader. Fred, hi, how are you this week? Hey, good evening, guys. Uh, Carlos, great to have you back. We missed you last week. Uh, Kira and I muddled through, and... Uh, we both say that uh, the show's much better when you're here. So uh, uh, glad to see you're back and I uh, hope everything's working out for you. I know you had a death in the family and we uh, give you our, our condolences for that. And, uh, and uh, I know it's a tough time for you. Hey, uh, final show of 2020, what a year. Uh, COVID, rescheduling, cancellations, masks, no fans, limited travel. It's been the craziest year we've ever seen and hope to ever see again. So I'm done with it. I'm over it. Let's move on. Let's let's wrap this up and get on to 2021. <laughs> let's move on and let's get started. But usually we have our top 10, but we have some honor roll mentions that we do every year. So we're going to start here in Clark. There was one piece of news that really hit everybody really, really hard. And that was uh, Mickey Wright's passing. And uh, tell us about it. Yes, indeed, Carlos. And, uh, you know, golf has lost some incredible characters uh, this year. Uh, most recently, Peter Alice, but we also lost um, Doug Sanders earlier in the year as well. But from a sheer playing perspective, as a golfer, uh, Mickey Wright was incomparable. Uh, she was beyond just about anybody else. And on February 17th, earlier in the year, uh, Mickey sadly passed away at the age of 85 after suffering a heart attack. Uh, and Mickey was born back in 1935 in San Diego, California. Uh, she later attended Stanford University and lost the final of the 1954 U.S. Women's Amateur Championship uh, before she turned professional later that year. She joined the LPGA Tour the following year in 55. And from 1956 to 1973, Mickey Wright won 82 times on the LPGA Tour, including 13 major championships. And among those were four U.S. Women's Opens and four Women's PGA Championships. Uh, but 
Despite that, she actually retired from golf as a full-time player at the age of just 34 in 1969 because of some issues she had with her feet. She had a recurring health problem with those, so it stopped her from playing regularly. Um, so who knows what more she could have achieved had her career lasted a few years longer. Uh, ben Hogan, he notably said that uh, Mickey Wright's swing was the best he'd ever seen in the game. Uh, in the year 2000, at the turn of the millennium, Mickey Wright was ranked as the ninth greatest golfer of all time, and specifically the top woman golfer uh, by Golf Digest magazine. Uh, in, a, in a major 2009 survey of experts, which was published by Golf magazine, she was chosen as the eighth best player of all time, and again, as the top female player in history. So guys, you know, Mickey Wright, I think, um, we're just obviously coming off the US Women's Open at the weekend there. And I think Mickey Wright will go down as one of the greatest golfers in the history of the game. Uh, not, not male, not female. She was one of the best uh, we've ever seen and we ever will see. And, and that will be her legacy uh, for generations to come as being one of the all-time greats. And uh, her loss at the beginning of the year was uh, certainly a sad one. Uh, definitely, it was a big loss among the many that we had this year. Fred, any quick words on that before we, we move on to your on our own match? Yeah, just uh, you know, four U.S. Women's Opens, four uh, women's PGAs, thirteen majors total, eighty-two LPGA Tour wins. Uh, really elite group. She, uh, you know, just a phenomenal, phenomenal record in the years that she played. Uh, Hogan said, you know, had the best swing he'd ever seen, and and. Uh, you know, so he was a man of few words. So when he speaks, most people listen. Um, yeah. And then we also uh, want to mention, you, you know, you mentioned the other two, Kerry and uh, Sean Connery had a lot to do with golf over the years. Yeah. And just by bringing golf into the movies, uh, brought a lot of golfers to the game back in the uh, in the 60s and 70s. So, um, yeah, a lot of a lot of big names this year we lost. We definitely did. And for her uh, about the swing, it, it was really commented everywhere. She had a sweet swing. And uh, uh, Michael Bamberger from golf.com said that she belonged in Mount Rushmore of golf. And I think yeah, he definitely got it right with that one. Now, our second honor roll mention of the year. Fred, it was the year of the exhibition. I mean, <laughs> 2020, it's unlike any other, just like Masters, right? The tradition of like any other. But 2020 was something, I, we still don't have words to describe what it was. But one of the great things that we saw, a lot of exhibitions, so how about that? Well, when tournament golf was shut down, uh, several players donated their time and efforts to helping various charities across the country, food banks, medical centers, first responders, all received assistance from the golf community. In May, Four tailor-made sponsored golfers, Dustin Johnson teamed with Rory McIlroy, Ricky Fowler paired up with rookie Matt Wolf for an event that was held at fabled Seminole Golf Club in Jupiter, Florida. Kind of a preview of the Walker Cup that's coming up next year. Uh, not too many people get to see Seminole, so it's kind of nice to see that made-for-TV event. Uh, Dustin Johnson and Rory pulled off the win, but other than that, more than $5 million was raised for COVID relief efforts during the show, which is what it was all about. With no sports action of any kind going on and the entire nation on lockdown, this became one of the most watched sports events of all time. Twitter and social media were live and running commentary. Speaking of commentators, they were all sitting in their homes doing the play-by-play -play from their living room couches. It was a far cry from the tower behind the 72nd hole. This was the first live sports action of any kind on TV since the opening round of the Players' Championship on March 12th. Leave it to golf to get some kind of sports back on TV. No football, no baseball, no basketball, no March Madness, none of that stuff. It took golf to get back on TV. The very next week, Tiger Woods and Peyton Manning paired off against Phil Mickelson and Tom Brady in a match at Medalist Club with a $10 million going to COVID-19 relief. It's a lot of money, guys, in just two weeks and a couple of exhibitions. In both these first two matches, the ongoing needling and conversations were worth the watch. When Tom Brady struggled to going and finally hit a meaningful shot, Tiger was heard to say, welcome to the match. That was one goat to another. Could you imagine Tiger Phil in helmet and pads ducking and juking away from 300-pound linemen trying to tackle them while throwing a football? 
Golf is the only sport that can accommodate athletes of all types in a fair competition. In November, Phil entertained in match three with Sir Charles, one of the worst golf swings of all time, against uh, Peyton Manning and Steph Curry to raise money for black colleges. Golf, again, is the only sport that can do that. They, they made a bunch of money for all these charities. Kudos to them for doing it. But without other sports action on TV, golf came to the rescue and television put on these exhibitions, guys. You know, to defend Charles Barkley, he he actually had a good swing last mm -hmm. time we saw him. I mean, uh, I, I guess that was the difference why he won with uh, Phil Mickelson. Not so much Phil. That, uh, uh, Kieran, how about the exhibition? Yeah, Charles carried him. Yes. <laughs> No, he did. He actually he did, and that was I think we think about twenty twenty being a very strange year. That might have been the strangest part of the year was Charles <laughs> Barkley turning up and striping the ball down the middle of the fairway every single time. He had a very metronomic swing suddenly with a um, five iron. Yeah, we, whatever works for you. It's just uh, it was fantastic to watch, and I'm very pleased for him because um, it couldn't have been easy for him to, to, to play the golf the way he did. And um, people did say that when he started playing the game early on. He was actually quite good at it and then he just lost the game and and really struggled with it and developed what was essentially the yips with the driver and the long clubs and and he seems to have overcome that and uh, he on on the pressure of being on tv you know in front of a big audience playing with these other great figures and um, he certainly um he showed them up in, uh, in our most recent match but yeah the exhibitions it's a bit of a throwback obviously to previous years we had more of these kind of money games and you know, some of the, the great players of all time, you know, traveled the world and played exhibitions all the time, whether it be things like Shell's Wonderful World of Golf or you know, the Big Free, you know, they traveled all across the world and, and promoted the game and made a lot of money for themselves too, actually. Um, so it was all, all great stuff. And, um, you know, while the purists in this world, Bill like myself, may not necessarily uh, be drawn to some of the more, you know, TV showbiz type golf like this is, uh, I cannot uh, deny that they raised a lot of money for charity, and particularly when it was most needed uh, in the middle of this year. And they, as Fred touched on, they gave us something to watch when there wasn't very much to see. And particularly that first event, the driving relief at Seminole, that was the first golf we'd seen on TV for, for at least two and a half months. And it was a, a little bit of a shining light uh, in the darkness. And so, yeah, I think that these events have a place in the game. And I think this year was perhaps a great time for them to show their prominence once again, because we needed some entertainment and they certainly delivered on that. And they also delivered on the charities that really one of the things that gets lost in all this lockdown pandemic that we had is that the charities depend a lot. I mean, golf gives like any other, no other sport and the charities that, depend on that for every single tournament that they were, that was already canceled or postponed, they were hurt by it. So in a way, and in a sense, it was great for them to be able to find a way to give back to those very, those that were in need. And mostly because also, you know, the pandemic hit so hard that definitely were in very much need. But with that, now let's get right into the top 10 and Kieran. The yes. PGA Tour champions. I mean, you got guys like Bernhard Langer leading again. The 63-year-old, he made the cut at the Masters. He was, he's the oldest to do so. He says, okay, so what color of jacket I get for that? You know, <laughs> and, uh, you have him, you have Phil Mickelson, won his first two. You have Jim Furyk, you had Steve Stricker there. You have golf most interesting man, Miguel Angel Jimenez. You have Ernie Els. I mean, isn't this the most interesting circuit in all of golf? You know, it might seem strange to say that, Carlos, but I, I think there's actually a really strong case that the Champions Tour might be the most purely watchable circuit on the in the game. And I think, you know, maybe it's perhaps it's because the players I grew up watching that you've just mentioned there, they're all getting to that age where they're eligible to play on the Champions Tour. So I'm naturally drawn to that. But 
I will make the case for it because I think that um, even though despite COVID, which shattered much of the schedule and we lost the senior PGA, we lost the US Senior Open, the Senior Open and the tradition, we lost a lot of big events in the Champions Tour. But despite that, as you touched on there, Carlos, we had some fantastic winners, an incredible group of names winning. As you say, Ernie Els, he won twice. Jim Furyk came on to the tour and looked unbeatable. He won twice, was going for three in a row and came very close to doing it. And then I think most excitingly of all, so did Phil Mickelson. People always questioned, would Phil go on the Champions Tour? Does he still think he's too good for that sort of thing? Well, he, he had a go and he excelled at it and found a, a second home amongst the over 50 circuit. Um, and he's a huge part of that this year and will surely be going forward. And as you said there, Miguel Angel Jimenez and also Darren Clark, they were also winners in 2020, as was Bernhard Langer, who continues to defy the years. Leading, leading, the, leading the tour going into 2021, and as you touched on earlier, Carlos, becoming the oldest player in history to make the cut at Augusta. And not just make the cut, he beat Bryson DeChambeau. You know, so there we go. I mean, that was uh, the tortoise and the hare in the same group at the weekend there at Augusta. And uh, you know, the great man, Bernhard, came out on top. So this particular season is unusual because it's going to continue throughout the entirety of next year. So Bernhard leads at the moment, but he has a full schedule to fend off these younger challengers uh, next year. And hopefully we'll see all the majors come back and play a more consistent schedule. And, you know, I can't wait to see it play out next year because I think on the Champions Tour, the scoring is usually low. So that's a lot of birdies, close leaderboards, plenty of excitement. And again, when you consider the caliber of those names that we've mentioned who are competitive on that circuit, I find that very appealing to watch. And let's say throw in the return of the majors next year. And, you know, Carlos, I think the Champions Tour is going to be highly compelling to follow in 2021. And I'm going to pay more attention to it, I think, next year than I ever have before. Definitely, it's uh, filling up with a lot of, like you're saying, a lot of the players, big time, big big name, big time players that are getting now to that 50 year old. And if if they lower that to you know 45, Fred, it might even get more interesting. How about the Champions Tour? Looking back at it in 2020. The only time I, if they're going to lower that to get Tiger involved, the only thing he's going to be interested in is possibly playing in the U.S. Senior Open or maybe the U.S. Senior PGA if he can't keep up with the young guys. And that I don't think he's going to do that between 45 and 50. He's still going to be out there banging around on the with the young guys. I'm not sure I would say the Champions Tour is the most compelling, but it is fun to watch the older guys still compete and it's truly amazing that Bernard Longer continues to do the things he does at the age of 63. Now, that is compelling. The Champions Tour held five events before they shut down in March. Um, Miguel and Hell, Longer and Ernie had won three of those. The Champions Tour was off and running. Then came a five-month shutdown. Seven events were canceled, one postponed. They restarted into July. You mentioned Jim Furyk won uh, there in Flint, Michigan at the Ally. Um, you got Kevin Southern winning the Charles Schwab championship once again. I, you know, what did he won three times? Tw two of those have been this event. The big story from last year for the champions tour was the fact that Phil uh, lowered himself to play a couple events on the champions tour. Lo and behold, he won. Um, and along with that, so he uh, won twice along with that. Ernie won twice. Furyk won twice. Darren Clark won at the end of the year. Good to see him in there. So, a lot, of, a lot of guys are moving up there. A lot of familiar names are moving into that Champions Tour, and that's exactly what they need, and it does make it worth watching for that. It definitely is, and uh, we, like Kira mentioned, that it's going to be a carryover throughout the whole season now. Hopefully they can play the full season, and uh, we're positive that 2021 is just going to be starting to get back to it the usual golf we, we have been watching before. So I, I bet Bernard Langer says, don't bet against me because I'm going to hold all these youngsters and I'm going to win it again. So we'll see, who knows? Maybe he'll be able to, maybe Ty finally hail Irwin and maybe pass him for the most wins on tour. But now let's talk about the number nine. And Fred, 
the pandemic, I mean, it's going to be all over <laughs> as we keep talking, uh, hit everywhere. But the LPGA might have been the most affected of all the tours. And they had to do virtually everything to try to keep it alive, try to maintain the sponsors happy, the players happy, the players were only getting started. And we had Michael Wan on the show and he explained to us all the different things that he had to do creatively to try to please everyone. So how about the year 2020 on the LPGA? Well, the LPGA was the first to be affected by the coronavirus because it is a world tour. They began their season in Florida with two events in January, then headed down under to Australia for the Vic Open and the Aussie Open in February before they were to head to Asia, where the pandemic was in full swing. Commissioner Michael Wan was forced to pull the plug and send everyone home. This had to be an unbelievably difficult decision for Juan and his staff to completely shut down. They were the first to do it. Everything else was still kind of going on. And the LPGA saw this major disruption. They were gonna to go to Asia and they, they knew, it, Juan always kept the safety of his players first and foremost, did not hesitate to shut it down. Even though they suspended operations, Juan continued to seek ways to find alternatives for added events. The drive-ons at Inverness and Reynolds Lake Oconee were the spur of the moment events that gave the players another opportunity to earn a few bucks and a place to play. The LPGA would not resume until the beginning of August with two tournaments held in Toledo, a hastily organized LPGA sponsored drive-on in Inverness, which gave fans a firsthand look at the home of the Solheim Cup that had been scheduled for this year, but was moved to 2021. The course had a major championship feel, and Danielle Kang proved she had put down, put her downtime to good use as she won at both the Inverness and then at the Marathon Classic the following week. Traveling together, the ladies then jumped on a plane in Detroit and flew to Scotland for the Scottish women's, with Stacey Louis, Lewis winning, and the women's open with unknown Sophia Popoff becoming one of the biggest stories in golf this year. I'm going to talk a little bit more about here later. She had been playing in the Cactus and the Sumatra Tours, got into the Marathon Classic, earned a spot in Scotland, and the rest is history. The LPGA was able to cobble together a schedule to help raise money for the charities in the cities they competed in, and ended the year just last week with another South Korean winning the U.S. Women's Open. The Koreans will still dominate. A few American women keep trying to break through, and the LPGA is truly a world tour. Kudos to the best sports administrator in the world, Michael Wan, and his staff for piecing together a schedule for the ladies and assuring their safety in the process, guys. Karen, how about the this story on the LPGA Tour? Definitely heavily affected, uh, but the way that they were able to bounce back and really make it seem like nothing happened when they came back. Great stories. Uh, what about the year 2020 on the LPGA? Yeah, absolutely. And I think Fred is, is, is right there in saying that, you know, obviously the LPGA Tour was the most uh, instantly, almost obviously affected tour uh, from the beginning uh, when things began to shift with the, also the Asian swing they were looking to, 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 to take part in and that obviously couldn't go ahead. And then the tour made the decision to shut down. And I think they were slightly ahead of the game. Whereas uh, I think other tours, I mean, I look at the PGA Tour, for example, that still tried to play the Players' Championship and then that ended in disaster, obviously having to basically shut it down halfway through after the first round. So I think the LPGA Tour was ahead of the game. And I think because of that, they were able to reschedule and plan effectively. And to have a schedule that took them across to, to the UK, obviously for the, for the Scottish events and the Women's Open, and then going back to the US and playing all the events they had there. And I think crucially, they managed to get four of the five major championships in there. And certainly the, the four most prestigious of the major championships. I still think the Evian's an event that just doesn't quite have the same cachet as the other four do. And I think the four majors that they had to put on all had, you know, you know, great finishes and terrific stories. Uh, some unlikely winners, as we'll discuss when we got into the first time major winner section on tonight's show. Spoiler alert, folks, for that one, but that's coming up. But some great storylines there. And obviously having these majors, particularly later in the year, and obviously having the US Women's Open in December, and of course the CME Globe Championship coming up as well in December too, before Christmas this week, indeed. So as recording this, 
um, as a chance for the LPGA to kind of get some attention uh, when, it, when it otherwise wouldn't have the opportunity to do so. So, you know, Mike Wan, obviously, in the past decade has has transformed the LPGA Tour. He came in at the most, you know, a low point, really probably American women's golf's ever been at in terms of the tour at the beginning of the of the past decade. And then over the you know the last 10 years, you know, they've grown in stature, prize money, you know, players, they've gone to better venues, better golf courses. And um, you know, they're still having to fight for media coverage. Um, that's not their problem, that's not their fault. I think the industry as a whole needs to take a more concentrated effort to shift that uh, reality and try and make these players stars and try and understand that uh, you know the, the LPGA is a compelling product and the players on it can offer so much, especially when ultimately you want to try and grow the game with regards to women and particularly young girls. And the best way to do it, to, to grow any sport, is to give people role models to aspire to be. Um, that's why people came to golf when Tiger was there. And because he was a role model, people want to be like him. And it would be wonderful if we gave you know, really positive female role models for young golfers emerging. And uh, there's plenty of people on that tour who can take that role, but they need to have the spotlight and the platform. Now, the LPJ and Mike Wan has given them the opportunity. Hopefully in the years to come, we'll see that you know, finally uh, bear fruit. But certainly this year, challenging for everybody, but the LPJ has come out of a, you know, with a lot of credit to get those four majors on was a massive thing. I think ultimately they delivered on some really good storylines and set themselves up for hopefully a better year to come in 21. And hopefully that's going to be the case for all of the tours because definitely they do need it, especially with the Olympics coming on in 2021. It's going to be a com very compelling year. Now let's talk about number eight, Tiger Woods and Phil Mickelson. I mean, Tiger Woods teased us with his first tournament at the Farmers. He finished T9. And everybody was like, oh, oh, yes, he is. He's going to have a great year. He couldn't finish better than T34 after that. Now, Phil Mickelson on the other side, he teased us always. He started with a T3 in Saudi. I mean, a, a T3 in um, AT&T. Then the, the third place finish at the Saudi International then a lot of missed cuts. Uh, he was nowhere to be found until he finished second at the WGC, but didn't do anything else. The best thing he did after that was win with Charles Barkley, but of course, that's with two basketball players on the other side. But anyway, um, a basketball player and a football player. Uh, so, Kieran, how about the year for Tiger Woods and Phil Nicholson? I know that we're giving a mulligan to everyone this year, but for Tiger and Phil, really feels I don't know like time is really passing by them well it was a very strange year for both Carlos both Tiger and Phil and I think we have to kind of put it into context uh, with Tiger initially and uh, look back at 2019 you know 12 months ago we were doing this show and we were talking about the Masters and the President's Cup and what Tiger had achieved that year and his Masters victory last April will go down as one of the truly most iconic you know golf moments and, and living memory, especially the celebration on 18 and the atmosphere. Uh, it was magical. So his 20, 2019 was stratospheric. He won the Masters, unforgettable. He won the Zozo Championship in Japan, fantastic. It equaled Samson's record for PJ Tour wins at that point. And of course, he led the US as playing captain to victory at the President's Cup at Royal Melbourne. What a great experience that was for him. He loved that. and. Uh, probably a career highlight for Tiger because he really loved you know being the captain and being in charge of those guys and, and being part of that team he embraced it so much and of course if you go back to the previous year he won the tour championship so essentially it was around 12 to 14 months there uh, that was magical for Tiger Woods and his fans and as you said Carlos he started this year with a top 10 at the Torrey Pines he made the cut at Riviera and that came before the shutdown and uh, everything stopped obviously uh, he came back at the Memorial uh, and he stuck to a very, very limited schedule. Um, he did play in the three majors that we had, but he wasn't really competitive in any of them. Uh, he missed the cut at the US Open at Wing Foot, which is kind of his bogey course, it seems like. Uh, he's missed the cut twice there now in US Opens. Uh, but the Masters, of course, he showed a sign of life in his defence. He shot 68 on the first day, his best opening round at Augusta in many, many years. 
Uh, but he progressively slipped down the leaderboard and of course he made that astonishing 10 on the final day on the 12th hole, golden bell, the par three, uh, shocking to watch. But then remarkably, he came back and he buried five holes, uh, showing his class. So I think with Tiger, um, it's been a strange year, a, a disrupted year, but for somebody with such a limited schedule as it is, um, he needed more events and he didn't have the opportunity because one, they weren't there. And then second, he didn't make up for lost time by playing in more tournaments. He played a very limited schedule. He never looked match ready. Obviously, he remains a quality player and he's not become a bad golfer overnight. Uh, but that limited schedule became more limited. And I think in that circumstance, it becomes harder to compete. And of course, we have to remember that he will soon turn 45 years old of age. And, um, you know, that's in certainly in the autumn of his career, um, potentially the winter if he gets that far. But uh, so I think next year is going to be a fascinating one for Tiger because I think almost in a sense this year, he was able to sit back and appreciate what he did last year at winning the Masters and coming back and being so competitive again and proving to himself that he could do it. So I think this year was a degree of, of just enjoying that achievement. And certainly at the Masters this year, people have spoken about how emotional he was at the Champions Dinner uh, and just how even his press conference that week when he spoke and he was tearing up, I think he was enjoying the moment this year of what he did last year, and he certainly earned it. Now, the question is, next season, he's almost starting afresh. You know, he was in the world's top 10 at the beginning of the year. Now he's not far off the top 50. I mean, he's saying he's 40 from the world this week, so he's got to make sure he remains in that um, elite top 50. So I think next year will be a reset for Tiger. Uh, will we see him play more often? Will we see him get back to more consistent form? I think we will see a better year for Tiger Woods. I think we'll see him be more competitive, potentially breaking that Sam Snead record. That's the next most realistic goal that he has to accomplish. I still think the, the Jack and Nicholas record for majors will remain un unobtainable. Um, but I think the Snead record's right there to be taken. And I feel that Tiger will have a better season next year than what he had this year. I think we can mark it down as being a unique year, um, one to you know, move on from for Tiger Woods. But for Phil Mickelson, now, we didn't see a lot of Tiger this year, of course, guys. But we saw a lot of Phil Mickelson. He was everywhere. You couldn't get him off your TV. As we discussed, he played exhibitions. He played Champions Tour. He, is, he was everywhere. And to me, guys, Phil Mickelson, his 2020 was a battle to remain relevant in whatever way possible. He has taken over social media. He's dominated these televised exhibitions, as we've discussed. He started selling a special coffee blend. I don't know what that's all about, but he started doing that. He started wearing aviator sunglasses, much like your future president. Perhaps Phil has political ambitions one day as well. You never know. But uh, and he was even so desperate for attention that, of course, he joined and won on the Champions Tour. So at 50, you know, Phil still believes he can, can compete on the main tour. I think the jury is certainly out on that one. Uh, I think you'll have to adapt his game if he wants to remain competitive. He seems to be trying to become longer and faster and more explosive rather than, rather than being more refined. I think would actually deliver him more success. But it's Phil Mickelson, wherever he's involved, it's going to be fun. It's going to be blockbuster. It's going to be hit and miss and up and downs. But uh, he certainly enjoys being Phil Mickelson. And uh, I say, I think this year, you know, Tiger took a back, back seat this year. Phil tried to fill that void uh, and his ongoing battle to remain a relevant figure in the game. Whatever is possible, he will do what he can to remain in the headlines. And uh, you got to say, he's quite good at it. How about that, uh, Fred? How about Phil and Tiger's 2020? Well, Kieran's right on, you know, about Tiger. He only played like five times this year. And he, you know, he did have that great buildup in 2018, 2019 when he came back and he, and he saw some success. And then this year he just didn't play and he was rusty, just wasn't tournament ready. You could see it. So, um, yeah, it was just a lost year for Tiger. But in a way, <clears throat> that's a good thing. Um, you know, there were some big gaps between even the starts that he <clears throat> did have spent a lot of time practicing and saving his body for the rigors of future major attempts. So guys, I, you know, he could win two more masters between the age of 45 and 50. He could win the masters twice in that five year span. 
he could maybe snag a, uh, a PGA in there. That gets him to 18, right? So, uh, Kieran, I don't know. I've still, I'm still holding out that there maybe is a chance. Uh, it's getting less and less every day, but there is a chance he might catch Jack. I, I don't know. It's, it's, it's a long shot, but it's possible. So, um, Phil, you know, Phil's Phil, you're right. Uh, he just didn't have much going on this year. Uh, uh, Carlos said it earlier, you know, a couple of uh, T3s or something early in the year. And then we saw that the year before. He played well at the early of the year and then just nothing after that. Uh, he was great in the exhibitions. He's really good at that. Um, I really think that that's where his calling is. I mean, he could do three or four of those a year, be entertaining and make a bunch of money doing that, do some other businesses play a little bit on the champions tour. I think that's what's going to work. We're going to have to see out of Phil. I just don't think he's going to be relevant on the regular tour anymore. So uh, hit the reset button, bring on 21. Let's see if Tiger can add more majors. As for Phil, he's always entertaining, but this year was a bust. I think his best days are past. His future lies in doing those exhibitions that he seems to excel in. Here's, here's a question for you guys. You mentioned Phil obviously being so good at the exhibitions and he's a great talker and he's very charismatic. You know, do you think Phil should go into TV? Should he become an announcer? I think that's in the next five to 10 years, maybe give him a few more years playing, but I think when he gets towards 55 and in his late 50s, I think surely, surely somebody's got to take Nick Faldo's place on CBS. It has to happen eventually. And surely Phil is the ideal guy to step in there because he would just tear it up. He'd be well, fantastic. Phil was, at Phil was fantastic when he sat in earlier this year for, That's right, he yes. in for an hour and a half. He was fantastic, you know, <laughs> telling stories and showing, talking about the shots that were there. And, you know, I mean, I don't know that I've ever seen anybody better. Uh, yeah. He was absolutely outstanding doing that. But I don't think he's ready to do that yet. And you're like you said, maybe another four or five years. And I don't know. That might be too confining for Phil. You know, he kind of likes to be. You know, mm. you, you got to be kind of on the straight and narrow on those as an announcer. On that. There's stuff you can say and can't say. I, yeah. I don't know how Phil would do with that. And I have to say, actually, on Tiger, I mean, for me, the best ending in the whole Tiger and Jack debate would actually be if they both finish on the 18 majors. 18. I, think that I, would... I, I absolutely agree with you on that. I, I think it would be great if you could just get to 18 yeah. and then be done. Yeah, I agree. Definitely. I agree with both of you. I think 18 would just start even more arguments. Who was the best? Who yeah, exactly. It would be like, no, it was a tiger. No, it was a... right now. You just say, Hey, Jack, one more. He was closer in most majors. So, but anyway, one, one last thing about tiger. I think also he was, he played nine times. Okay. Nine times this year, but we saw him sporadically. It was, so far in between each one of them because he was also ill. So it wasn't like he was in the perfect shape. Uh, of course, the lockdown didn't allow him to really prepare as he usually do. We know that Tiger is a creature of habits and uh, every preparation that he does for every tournament, including the majors was very different this time. And uh, we'll see maybe next year we can see him you know, starting to get back into it. Now he's playing with his son at the PNC, uh, which is something that he wanted to do. And it's, of course, that's like an exhibition, but who knows, maybe we'll see him come back uh, and do some of that magic that he, he did those, during those 14 months uh, last time. Okay, now to number seven, okay? It was the year of the first time winners in the major. So uh, Fred, how about that? We got great stories starting with Sofia Popov winning on the LPGA, her first major. Yeah, I, I, I'm gonna save her for just a minute, but yeah, that, she was a fantastic story. Kyle Marikawa, you know, I got on the Kyle Marikawa bandwagon early and I believe he's going to be a huge force on the PGA Tour for several years to come. He and his two amigos, Matt Wolf and Victor Hovland will drive each other to compete and perform. Marikawa's fourth round at Harding Park was a masterpiece. He hit that high cut off the tee box, hit a wonderfully shaped irons into the greens. His driver to that short par four, I think it was the 16th hole, was a thing of absolute beauty. And it showed that he was there to win, not just collect a big check. The US Open, we got Bryson DeChambeau. It was his first major. It was somewhat of a surprise that DeChambeau would succeed at a U.S. Open on a golf course 
that normally doesn't cater to long hitters. Tree-lined and relatively tight, it seemed to demand a control game, but Bryson just drove it over and around the trees, flipped wedges into the greens to have the distinct advantage over the rest of the field. This win, more than anything else, validated DeChambeau's science project and has probably spurred him on to accomplish even more in the coming years. Now let's talk about the Women's Open Championship. Sophia Popoff came out of nowhere to win a Women's Major Championship. She was playing on the Cactus Tour and the Sumatra Tour, even caddying for Annie Van Dam at the restart of the LPJ season at Inverness. She was outside the top 300 in the world. This was a true Cinderella story and one which makes us enjoy covering golf and telling these types of stories. On a more serious note, the LPGA has given a sponsor's exemption to Natalie Galvis and not to Sofia Popov for the CME Group Championship this weekend because she was not an LPGA Tour member when she won the Women's Open. Well, she is now, and this is one of the rare mistakes that the LPGA Tour makes. Natalie Galvis hasn't made a cut for three years. Why is she in this championship field? By the way, Jin Yen Ko, on the strength of her runner-up finish last week at the U.S. Women's Open, did earn a spot this week in the CME Group Championship. So moving on, I got a couple more to talk about. Uh, women's PGA, uh, Se Young Kim, had 10 tour wins and is the best player in the women's game right now. She got her first major title in 2020 at the Women's PGA over NB Park, plus added a win at the Pelican in November. Now with 12 LPGA Tour wins and five titles in Korea, she is no strong stranger to the winner's circle. Look for her to add more major hardware next week, next year. Then we come up to the, to the tournament just completed, the U.S. Women's Open. A. Lim Kim came from nowhere to fire the 68 on Sunday to win the final major of the year at the U.S. Women's Open. Birdies down the stretch on the final holes propel, propelled her past Amy Olsen and Zhang Young Kim. Her iron play was magnificent. She's not an LPGA Tour member, but probably will accept for full term membership now and we'll see her on the tour. So guys, um, a lot of first time winners and majors this year. We had a couple majors that weren't played, the Evian, the Open Championship for the men, uh, but still it ended up being a great year. I got to watch a lot of Monday's finish on the, um, on the uh, U.S. Women's Open. Uh, a couple things from that, um, uh, Shibuno, her swing, uh, they, I had, did not realize her swing was that good. They, they did a slow-mo of one of her driver swings. I rewatched that about five times. It is absolutely perfect. If you want to see a perfect golf swing, go back to uh, Monday's coverage or whenever it was and, and do that slow-mo. No, it was actually on Saturday. The slow-mo they had her driver swing, it was, ab it was absolutely dead solid, perfect, every position. And Amy Olson, I was really pulling for her. Uh, really a shame she didn't get the win. But uh, a lot of, lot of good stuff. A lot of first-time winners and majors this year, guys. How about that, Kieran? I mean, uh, it was if there was a year for a lot of this sort of crisis was 2020, but we got some great stories, those first-time winners. Oh, we certainly did, Carlos. And, and your friends touched on them there, uh, particularly on the, on the LPGA Tour. And obviously, when you come to, when you look at um, first-time major winners, and obviously winning a major is a stratospheric achievement for any golfer. It's the pinnacle, it's the ultimate, it's becoming part of history. Um, and we somewhat unfairly judge golfers by the number of majors that they've won. I mean, if you win one of them, then that's an unbelievable achievement. So all these players who've won this year, you know, are part of history. But the question is, who will go on and win more majors and then become, you know, a top player of their era. And certainly on the PGA Tour, you look at Colin Morikawa and Bryson DeChambeau, those are two guys who are first-time major winners that you you could easily see winning several majors. Uh, Morikawa is someone who, I agree with Fred, I think he's just a magnificent golfer, uh, one of the best we've seen emerge in a long time, one of the most accomplished players that we've seen come onto the Tour. And I think the shot he played on the 16th hole there at Harding Park and making that eagle in the short par four, for me, that's the shot of the year. It's the one that stands out to me most of all. Um, my shot of last year was actually Suzanne Pedersen's putt at the Solheim Cup to win and then walk off and retire. That was my shot of last year. But this year, I think it has to be Colin Morikawa at the PGA. But, uh, and, and DeChambeau, obviously, as well. We'll talk about him very shortly. Another spoiler alert there on the show. But yeah, on the LPGA Tour, fantastic stories. Sophia Popoff, 
unbelievable. What what a, a what an experience to watch that and what a story so just magical and as Fred touched on it was that Cinderella story that reminds you of just how special this game can be and how just one week to the next people can just transform their lives and she certainly did that there at Royal Troom and of course it was also quite you know interesting and telling and significant that this year we had the women's open but not the Open Championship. And I think that stood out quite a lot um, when the, the LPGA and the LDT turned up at Troon uh, back in August. But elsewhere, it'd be remiss not to mention uh, Miriam Lee at the ENA Inspiration, uh, who won there her first major championship. You know, underrated player, I think, before that week. And a bit of an odd finish there. We had those surreal scenes around the 80 green, that wall that they had there and the, the rules and fractions. And, it became, it became a little bit gimmicky, as to be said at the end there, but Miriam Lee produced an amazing short game masterclass, chipping in, I think, three times in that final round. And she, of course, she won the playoff over Brooke Henderson and Nelly Corder. Most eyes were on those two, and Miriam Lee came through and took the win. As for uh, Se Young Kim and A Lim Kim, I think both those players, their two final rounds in those majors that they won, the PJ and the Women's Open, US Open, or two fantastic performances. You know, the 63 that Se Young Kim shot there was magnificent. I mean, that's one of the best final rounds you'll see in a major championship. And indeed, at the Champions Club on Monday, that 67 and birding the last three holes on that golf course in those conditions, uh, that was magnificent. And maybe it was quite, you know, fitting that the, the last major winner of this year was did so in a face mask, probably the defining accessory of 2020. And uh, she had that on and she played some amazing golf, a player that not many of us will have known much about of before her first major appearance, indeed, in any championship. And, and she won it. Uh, unbelievable. Another star emerging. And this shows you that the LPGA, they keep identifying these new stars, players who come onto the tour, particularly from South Korea, and they appear and they just seem to be so accomplished and ready to win the biggest championships. And uh, that was another example right there. So this past year, we saw some great first-time major winners, some you know, heartwarming stories. But for some of these players, Carlos, I think their first win in a major will not be the last. And specifically, I'm looking at Deshambo, Morikawa, and Se Young Kim. I think there'll be more majors in their futures to come, potentially, indeed, in 2021. Definitely, we'll have to look forward to that. Uh, I agree with you. Those three are uh, maybe a cut above the others, but I, I think Ailey Kim, Aileen Kim mm -hmm. I think she, she, if she accepts, which I think she will, full uh, membership here in the LPGA, I, I think we haven't seen the last of her winning big time tournaments. But talking about Bryson DeChambeau, I mean, he gave Tour de Force a name on the PGA Tour. He won the major, you mentioned it for the first time, but it, it was the constant talk about maybe more about his transformation and how he's maybe transforming golf. Mm -hmm. What has been the story of 2020 with him and that's why he's at number six. Absolutely, Carlos. And uh, I think, you know, obviously we can talk about Dustin Johnson winning the Masters or Colin Morikawa winning the PGA and all the other great players who've had fantastic years in all sides of the game. But Bryson DeChambeau, I think, was easily the most talked about golfer of 2020. He made himself the headline act every week. It was amazing to watch. And of course, as you mentioned, it really first started with his physical transformation. So much was made about this. You know, he began the physical change in the past year before the shutdown. He gained around 20 pounds in weight and muscle. But then during the shutdown, he gained another 20. He was consuming a diet that makes my stomach churn just thinking about it. I mean, a diet that would kill mere mortals. I mean, there are, there are cattle in the fields that have a better diet than Bryson DeChambeau does. It cannot be healthy for you in the long term. I really would question that. But he believed he identified a way to become truly successful, which was to become powerful, stronger. He believed that distance was the secret to unlocking every golf course and unlocking major titles. He made that scientific calculation of, if I'm close to the green, even if I'm in the rough, 
uh, I've still got a great chance. I'm still in a better position than the guy 100 yards behind me. And that's the philosophy that he promoted during the shutdown on his social media channels and a lot spoken about it. And then he came on to the tour and he produced some fantastic form initially on the PGA Tour uh, when, we, when we came back at the, the, the Colonial, at the Charles Schwab Challenge. So he talked about how far he was going to hit the ball, his 400 yards, his speed was getting just ridiculous and beyond almost the level of those long drive champions who'd hit the ball a ridiculous distance. But it wasn't just the fact that he was hitting the ball so far. I mean, a lot of these players can hit the ball basically as far as Bryson DeChambeau does, but it was the fact that he was going to deploy it so you know liberally. He was going to use it all the time. He had this aggressive game plan that had everyone panicking that he was basically going to break the game. And I think he almost had that ambition himself. So did he break the game? Well, you know, as I say, he played magnificently following the restart. He contended weekly. He was there all the time. And of course, he won in Detroit in July when he beat Matt Wolf there at the Rocket Mortgage Classic. He shot 65 in that final round and he just, you know, blew away the field in the final day. And he came into that week with six straight top eight finishes. And he was the only player with top 10s in the first three events after the restart in June. So he came back and he was in fantastic form. And then, of course, he contended at the PGA Championship, ultimately finishing a tie for fourth with Morikawa winning. So going into the Masters, obviously he won the US Open at, um, at Wingfoot. And as Fred touched on there, he seemed to defy the logic of that. People said, well, Bryson, this golf course will eat him up. He will fall foul to the rough and the difficulty of wing foot. But he, his philosophy rung true and he secured his first major victory. And it was an accomplishment. Um, whatever you think of Bryson um, as an individual, what he believes in, what he does, you have to admire the dedication uh, he put into that and what he's done to transform his game and be successful. And he's, he's succeeded. But going into the Masters, uh, he was considered a favourite by many people. And of course, he's talked about the Augusta National being a par 67, which was a cru critical error when he said that before the tournament. Um, you don't see these things. Um, and he grossly underperformed there. He finished T34, finished behind Bernard Langer, of course. But also during the year, he's found himself mired in controversies. I mean, he was arguing with cameramen. He was contending with rules officials. But it was always interesting. Uh, but for 2021... Will Bryson carry on leading the way in this game as, as a long hitter, but also potentially paving a way for other players to follow? And they see him, you know, guys at Tony Fina, Rory McIlroy, they could easily ramp it up and hit the ball as far as, as Bryson does and adopt that similar philosophy. If he continues to succeed and play well and win championships, other players might think, you know, there's something to this. Um, he, he might become a trendsetter. Or will he fail to maintain that standard? Will his body you know, be able to withstand what he's doing to it? Time will tell, but uh, there's no question to me, Carlos, that uh, Bryson DeChambeau, um, he wasn't necessarily the player of 2020, but he was in so many ways the story of 2020 because we spoke about him every week. He definitely was. Uh, every week, we basically were talking about him one way or the other. And uh, that new transformation became the novelty on on the golf tour. And like you're mentioning, I think, Fred, it's, it's just time will tell us if his formula will work or not. Uh, I think Kieran said it first. Will he be a trendsetter or just the one that trends the set sets the trend towards the other way. So, uh, what's your take on what Bryson DeChambeau? Definitely, I agree. He was the story among the players. Well, my first question is, who put this at number six? Uh, Bryson. That's all we talked about all year was Bryson DeChambeau. <laughs> he should be like two or three or something. I'm gonna. I need to talk to the management. Who? I, I, I got a complaint here. Um, <laughs> This, you know what, he, he could have been, if it would have been for COVID, he could have been the biggest story of the year, even with what Dustin Johnson did, even with some of the other things that we've got here tonight. Uh, I mean, we were just talking about him every week. Um, and, you know, winning at wing foot, we talked about it earlier. Uh, that's a place, I mean, he was in driver wedge to 450 yard par fours at wing foot. Just unbelievable stuff. 
Um, do I expect to see more guys bulking up? Uh, no. Do I see guys figuring out how to swing harder? Well, yes, but that has always been the demand. Bobby Jones was the longest of his day. Jack was long. Tiger continued to trend. His dad taught him to swing hard when he was young, and he's continued that trend today. This is not a new con concept, but DeChambeau has taken it to new heights, and every media outlet in the world is following his every move to see what's going to happen next, guys. And you know we're going to be talking about it every Tuesday night next year. <laughs> so maybe I'll talk to management to see if next year we can bump <laughs> this one up a little bit more. We'll see what happens there. But I, I think also a big news, and that's number five, it was the adventures of the three amigos. And most of it is because they are maybe the future of golf. And we're talking about Colin Marikawa, Matthew Wolf, and Victor Hoffman. They all did great things here in this year. And it's maybe a glimpse of what we might be seeing down in the future. So Fred, tell us a little bit about them. Yeah, they jumped on the tour last summer, and all three have made an impact. Uh, of course, Hovland, you know, they came out with no status. They had to earn their right to, to get on the tour. Hovland was the only one that didn't win in 2019, had to go through the uh, final series uh, on the uh, Corn Ferry Tour to, uh, to get his card for 2020. But they've all done really well. These three guys, Colin Morikawa, Matthew Wolf, Victor Hovland, Highly touted. They turned professional in the summer of 2019 after Wolf had won the individual medalist honors for the NCAA Golf Championships. Wolf and Morikawa won immediately in the fall wraparound. Hovland added two wins this year. Morikawa won big at Muirfield Village right after the restart and then added the Wanamaker Trophy by winning the PGA Championship. Wolf had one win in 2020, earned over $3.5 million, and is up to number 14 in the world. That's just, I mean, in a limited schedule this year and of a part of a year last year. Oh, yeah, he was runner-up at the U.S. Open and has already earned over $2 million for 2021. With his win a few weeks ago in Mayakoba, Hovlin is third in the FedEx Cup and 15th in the world golf ranking, heading to the first of the year. He's already earned $1.8 million for 2021 and now will be looking to add a major to his resume next year. As I mentioned, Mark Howell won in the fall of 2019, added a win at the Workday Charity Open and the PGA Championship. He earned nearly $7 million in 2020 and is up to number seven in the top 10 on the world golf ranking. All three have game and aren't afraid of the bright lights and the pressure of the hunt. They will have an impact on the PGA Tour for several years to come, guys. I can't wait to watch these three guys. I, I love watching them play. What do you think, Karen? I mean, uh, Morikawa already a major winner. Wolf was almost a major winner as well, a runner up there. He he's definitely on knocking on on the door of another major. And Hovland just another win just recently. Uh, how about this three? Do you do you see them? I mean, how about their their year and what you think about them in the future? Well, I think their rise, uh, all three of them. Um, has been stratospheric. I mean, 18 months ago, they were all in college, essentially, and now they're PGA Tour stars and they're in the world's top 15, all three of them. Um, so it's been a magnificent rise. Morikawa, obviously, winning the major stands out, but the other two are, are right there as well. Uh, Matt Wolf, I forget how young he actually is. I mean, he's only 21. He's a, a couple of years younger than the other two. So he is still a long, long way to go in his progression. Um, so we, I expect great things uh, from all three of them next year. Uh, but you know they're they're fantastic players and you're know, quite good personalities as well. But they're also a little bit different how they play and how they swing the golf club, and I think that makes for highly compelling viewing. So these three players, they've come onto the tour, they've kind of they've almost jumped ahead of the game. I mean, they've just some players would take a while to come on the tour and they have to establish themselves and pick up some wins and maybe try and get a top ten or two and try and keep their card. These guys come on there and they win straight away. And it's kind of, um, I mentioned the LPGA Tour earlier and how the players on the LPGA Tour, so many players on that tour for years now, have come from seemingly nowhere, particularly young players, and triumphed very young and very early. The PGA Tour, it also took a little bit longer for players to reach that level. These three guys are kind of showing that, you know, they can jump ahead of that, that queue, that uh, line, and you'll know, reach the top. So I think all three of them, 
will be uh, standouts next year. I think Morikawa and Hovland in particular, I just feel those two will win more than Matt Wolf will do. But I think Matt Wolf has so much untapped potential and there's, a, there's an unbelievable golfer in there. Uh, but the other two, I think, are slightly more refined and I can see them you know, contending in majors next year. That's the one thing Hovland has not done yet, is actually contending in a major. The other two obviously have done that. I see Hovland contending in majors, being in the Ryder Cup team for Europe and being a great star next year. And Morikawa, he's certainly one to watch in the majors. And Matt Wolf, I think he could have a few weeks of the year where he blows away a field. So I think all three of these guys are great to watch and I look forward to seeing what they're going to do next year. Hey, Matt Wolf is my guy, so don't 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 talk about him like that. I think he's going to be the best of the three. <laughs> yeah, the best of the three. Oh, yes. oh that's kind of, I, 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 I think I think Fred's on Team Morikawa, and I'm going to be yeah, on Team Hovland. Then, uh, so I'm it's be... him and Team Morikawa. I am and Team uh, Wolf, and uh, I'm, I'll, I'll I'm with the Team bad Hovland, Wolf. Then. You'll see. You'll see. Oh, okay. You'll see. But anyway. Um, Let's move on to the next one. And right now we're down to number four. And we have to talk about the dominant. We talked about the force that was Bryson DeChambeau on the physical side, but we have to talk about really performance wise. And that was Dustin Johnson. I mean, after August, he went T12 in the WGC FedEx uh, St. Jude. Then on the PGA Championship, he was T2. Northern Trust, he won. He was a second, solo second at the BMW Championship. Then he was in the Tour Championship. He won it. After that, he was in the U.S. Open uh, T6, T2 on the Vivian Houston Open. And, of course, he won the Masters. Definitely nobody has gone into such a run the whole year. And he was dominant as anybody can be during that run. He definitely is the hottest player, number one player in the world right now, number one in the Fighters Cup. So, Kieran, tell us about this dominance from Dustin Johnson, especially after the lockdown. Yeah, very much so, Carlos. And uh, you're coming into this year, you know, Rory McIlroy, Brooks Kepka, we haven't even talked about tonight, and Tiger Woods, they were the, the headline makers coming into this year. Eyes were on them, but none of them impressed. They all underperformed this season. Bryson DeChambeau, of course, he dominated the headlines. He was the man. He's, you know, the story of the year. But it was Dustin Johnson who you know, walked away with, I think, the greatest accolades and uh, the greatest standing in the game going into next year. But, you know, it wasn't always you know, smooth sailing, Carlos. I mean, he returned from the shutdown. He won the Travellers. But then he had two very strange weeks in the summer when he shot 80-80 at the Memorial and finished, I think, second last in the field. And then he withdrew from the 3M Open after a 78. He also had a, a bout with... Um, COVID-19 as well at one point. But since then, as you say, he's been imperious. You know, second at the PGA, won the Northern Trust, lost to John Ram in a thriller at the BMW Championship. You know, what a finish that was. What putts. I mean, that was just unbelievable to watch. Uh, and of course, he ultimately won the FedEx Cup. So, and the big money goes with that too. He was sixth at the US Open. Putts, those putts, Kieran, were the second. They were, they were the runner-up shots of the year. Those putts that Ram and DJ hold in that in their thrilling finish there uh, I, I, I think um i think that was uh, for me that was the, the most exciting moment of the year watching golf were those two going head to head like that yeah. and i think the two parts were just uh, yeah you know obviously it was a bmw championship if that was a major championship it would have been you know it would have been the, the moment of the year but it was definitely in contention but uh, yeah so obviously dustin he came to augusta and he won the masters by five shots 20 under par you know, two shots better than the previous record that was held by Tiger and Jordan Spieth. And his second major and his first Masters, and uh, you saw what it meant to him. You know, he's not someone who gives much away emotion-wise. Him and his brother Austin, it meant so much to him to win the Masters. And he, that wonderful interview that, that Dustin gave, not the, the usual creepy one in the Butler cabin that's one of the weirdest things in televised sport. I mean, the Master, I love the Masters, but I mean, seriously, the the, the butler cabin ceremony has to go it's not right it's weird but the interview he gave uh, to amanda balionis on the green that was great tv that's what it was about raw emotion and he showed that there and it places him in a great position you know he has two majors 24 wins in the pga tour he's won a tournament every season for the last 14 seasons which is amazing what consistency and you know i feel and i spoke to 
Fred about this last week, that I think that uh, at 36 years of age that he is now, I think uh, Dustin is on the precipice, the edge of becoming potentially a generational defining player, uh, an all-time great. Now, he probably needs another two or three majors at least to achieve that status, but I certainly wouldn't bet against him. I believe that Dustin Johnson is the man to beat going into next season, and I think he's someone who, in the next three or four years, he could become the, the defining player of his era, and he could become one of the all-time greats. I think that's going to be a fascinating story, and it's a challenge I've outlined there to Rory McIlroy. Can he come back and show that he's still the player of his generation, or will Dustin ultimately be the one that runs away with it? So I think we can see that as a potential battle in 2021 it's up to rory to see if he accepts it but definitely dustin is headed towards that and it seems like he's just gaining confidence and more confidence as the years go by uh fred how about dustin johnson's dominance performance here yeah the three-month run he had there at the end of the year uh that's that's really good stuff uh that uh, that ranks up there with some of the stuff that tiger was doing um, and Kieran, I, I think he could be a generational player, but the only question I have about Dustin Johnson is from the shoulders up. Uh, does he, you know, he's got two majors now, the Masters win meant a lot to him. Does he just go off into the sunset and say, oh, okay, I, I've done my thing. I, you know, I made all this money. I'm good to go. Um, you know, I don't really need to win it. Does he maintain that drive to stay at the level it takes to win those major championships? And, you know, as you know, that takes a lot of work, a lot of stamina, a lot of mental fortitude to do that. Uh, is he up to that? And that's that's my that's my only question. Other than that, uh, Rory, Rom, Justin Thomas and the rest have to take a back seat and only hope Johnson will slump or get hurt in 2021. That's the only way they're going to catch him. But now at 36 years old. And in fabulous physical condition, he doesn't look to be backsliding anytime soon if he doesn't lose a desire to keep winning. Uh, and that's the thing. He being such a private person, we don't know much about him. Uh, I think that the most that we have seen him talk was in that <clears throat> master's interview. And uh, we don't know really what drives him. But I, I, I truly think he does. I yeah. uh, want to win more. I, I, I just well, don't so I've think... Been in, I've been in several tournaments and, and sat in press conferences with, with uh, Dustin at the podium. And he kind of toys with the media. He doesn't yes. give much away. He, he plays the dumb uh, fool, okay? Uh, and he does it very well. Uh, I think he's probably a really smart guy, but he comes off like, oh, shucks, I don't know. You know, I just like the sandwiches. You know, he plays that role really well, okay? But he's not really quite like that, I think, underneath. So, uh, he, I, I, you know, I don't know. It just, it, to me, is he, he works really hard. Does he have the drive to keep doing it? Well, actually, the interesting thing on that, so um, I think you're right there, Fred. I think there is far more to, to Dustin than initially meets the eye. And you know, Butch Harmon, who knows him so well, he's been a massive part of uh, golf coverage, particularly in the UK. He works for Sky Sports for 20 odd years. And uh, he, he was announcing at the Masters this year for UK TV. And he knows Dustin so well. And he says that nobody works harder than Dustin. Um, he has got a drive to him, he has got a determination. He's just very laid back as a personality. And that, I think, comes across as being that kind of all shucks, that kind of just, uh, I'm not really caring too much about it. His intensity is not through his personality, it's through his game and the work he puts into it. And he has put so much work into his game where maybe when he was younger, I think he didn't. But in the last sort of five or six years, I think, since he became a father, it's a bit of a cliche, but I think when he became a father, that did change him. He began, began to work heavily on his wedge game and his short game, and he's now so much better at that. He always was a, a long hitter, tremendous driver of the golf ball, but from 100 yards and then he's now as good as anybody, and that's why he's now the best player in the world as it stands. So I think he's someone who can really do what he, he can achieve what he wants to achieve. And I think with all these players now, it's you know it's very rare to see a, a to see a, a Tiger Woods or a Jack Nicklaus, the player who always wants to reach that little bit further, because you don't have to do it. You can be a, a, a relatively modest player and have a great living and a very comfortable life. It takes something very special to go that extra yard to 
want to become part of history, become one of those defining players. I think Dustin has got more about him than, than meets the eye. And I think unlike some other people, maybe like Bryson DeChambeau and so on, it's fun to have him there. I think Bryson, sorry, Dustin lets his golf clubs do the talking. And uh, it's a shame because I think there is more to him than meets the eye. And I think we saw little glimpses of that at the Masters, that he has got a personality, he does care. Um, and maybe we'll see more of that going into next year. And then if we do get that, then I think we might see a greater appreciation for what he can do as a golfer, because it's so much of the reason why Roy McIlroy is such a popular figure in the game and it has, I think, is still the most defining player of his era, is not just because of his success and the way he plays golf, but because he speaks so well and he's so engaging and he's so articulate and outspoken at times. Dustin isn't like that. If we saw a little bit more of that, then maybe people will start looking at him in that way. But I think, um, you know, next year and beyond, that Dustin could be that the guy uh, in the next couple of years. But as I say, as Fred touched on there, there's a lot of players that uh, are just behind him waiting to pick up the scraps if he does drop his game slightly, which, of course, can certainly happen. Or indeed, if he falls down in our flight of stairs, hopefully not. <laughs> now, and uh, I think it's brilliant the way that he, do, that he does it because it deflects the attention from him and the expectations. Yep. It just lets everybody talk about him. And uh, for him, you see Roy McIlroy, like you were mentioning, everybody just goes to him because he's just talking and talking. And whether he gets his foot in his mouth or not by what he says, well, he's going to say whatever is in his mind. And sometimes that puts a lot of pressure on Roy McIlroy to perform. I think that's something that's taking him back a little bit because maybe he's setting some expectations that he might not be able to do and put some more pressure on him by Dustin doing the opposite. He's taking that deflection and expectations off him and he just goes out there and like Kieran saying, just letting his clubs do the talking. So Bryson DeChambeau, come on, get those, uh, those words there. Shut up a little bit and apply it. <laughs> Now, let's go to number three, okay? There is a strategic, strategic, okay, uh, alliance between the European Tour and the PGA Tour. We talked about this. This is definitely something major because I think there's more than meets the eye there, and there's nobody better than Fred and Kieran to talk about it. So, Fred, how about that strategic alliance? We're coming, Kieran. We're coming for you. The American. <laughs> You're coming. taking over. <laughs> You're taking over, buddy. What about the European Tour, though? Being able to have several tournaments and ending with Lee Westwood winning the race to Dubai one more time. Let's hear it for the old guys. We've been talking about the Premier Golf League, the European Tour, the PGA Tour, and a World Golf League all year long. Carlos and I even did a short video back in February about how easy it would be to create an 18 tournament series that would cater to the best players in the world and provide the largest purses with eight big U.S. events. The players, Memorial Palmer, Tigers Genesis, Farmers, and the three FedEx Cup playoff events, the Northern Trust, BMW, and the Tour Championship. Ten international events, the BMW PGA, Irish, Scottish, Italian, Turkish Airlines, Nedbag, Abu Dhabi. DP World Championships, the Zozo and the CJ Cup would yield 18 big events with huge purses and more importantly, gigantic international audiences for sponsors to pony up the fees. Carlos, I think they probably, the PGA Tour probably saw our video and they're probably working towards this and they're telling Keith Bell, they say, hey, these guys say this is what we can do and probably it's going to happen, I'm guessing. They would bring the top 36 or 50 players from around the world onto this world tour playing for the $10 million purses. This is what the elite players are going to demand. Throw in the four majors and the four WGCs, you have a total of 26 big time events that could keep the Rory's, Dustin Johnson's, Justin Rose's, Justin Thomas's and Jason and John Rahm's the world interested. European tour had to be hemorrhaging money with the problems COVID created for scheduling and sponsors not getting their money's worth. The Euro Tour had just announced today that their big money Rolex series has been reduced from eight events to four for 2021, with each having a prize fund of at least eight million. The 2021 European Tour schedule contains 42 tournaments in 24 countries between January and November. 
Abu Dhabi, the Scottish Open, the BMW will all keep the $8 million purse. The DP World Championship will be nine. That's the four Rolex series for next year. So all of that is background to the addition of PGA Tour Commissioner Jay Monahan to the European Tours Board of Directors was in re direct response to the tour kicking in a bunch of cash to the European Tour and greasing the wheel for closer relations between the two professional golf tours to prohibit the Pre Premier Golf League from getting a toehold on the world's best talent and disrupting the tour's allure. We're going to have to watch to see how this works out, guys, but uh, this was really a blocking move from the PGA Tour helping the, the European Tour to keep the Premier Golf League out. Uh, what's going to happen down the world, down the road? Are we going to have a true world golf tour? Only time will tell, but it would be easy to do, and I think the golfers are going to demand it. Karen, from your side there on the, on the in Europe, um, you see the way that we're seeing it here. Uh, was it really, how does it take, what was the take on Europe about this alliance? And uh, is it really that the, the PGA Tour is trying to fend off the Premier Golf League? Do you think there's going to be a really a world tour after this facilitated by that? What's the take on that side? Yeah, I, I don't think it was a great surprise. And I think these conversations have been happening for a long time. And I think two things happened this year that accelerated that. One of them was the pandemic. And secondly, was the Premier Golf League and the threat that it posed to both the PGA Tour and the European Tour. So there was a, a degree of um, self-sufficiency and coming together to protect themselves and uh, to kind of fend off that potential threat from the Premier Golf League that hasn't necessarily gone away entirely. I mean, do watch this space. There might still be some moves made there and some music to be heard from the apparent uh, PGL. Uh, but in terms of the PGA Tour and the European Tour, um, it's not a great surprise that this has happened. And I think it was inevitable. The European Tour has kind of limped along for a long time. It does it has managed to do so relatively successfully. But when you look in, when you look beyond the headlines, you see how fragile so much of the tour is and how weak some of the events are. It's all fine saying there are 42 events in 24 countries. A lot of those are very weak events, not great prize money. Literally, the European Tour had to dig into its own pocket this year and put prize funds up for the UK swing events to essentially give the TV companies a sufficient number of tournaments to still earn their money. Otherwise, they'd have been liable to huge uh, fees and losing millions and millions of, of dollars. Um, so, uh, yeah, the European Tour was in a, a fragile position. And the PGA Tour sees an opportunity there. And it's twofold. So, one, it's... I think the most crucial thing that hasn't actually been spoken about too much about it is the PGA Tour has its partnership with the Discovery Channel to basically launch its own specific golf network in the coming years, particularly internationally. And the European Tour is going to become a part of that. I have no question about that. Um, the PGA Tour wants to be in a position where it can sell the PGA Tour golf and European Tour golf as one package, as one thing under one umbrella and people will subscribe to this Discovery Channel or Golf TV as it will be known as out with the United States. So the end of 2022, so in two years from now, the European tour television rights become available internationally. And Sky Sports has those in the UK and has supported the tour for a long time. But there's no doubt that the, in my mind, this will ultimately go to Golf TV which is overseen by the Discovery Channel and the PGA Tour. So it's about the PGA Tour coming in, controlling events, controlling the revenue streams and controlling the audience as well and having access to everybody. Huge international marketplace. You know, we could see in the years to come, as Fred touched on, this kind of super tour, enhanced events worldwide, sending stars all over the globe. I think that's inevitable. That's going to happen at some point. Uh, it is a case of it'll take several years to get to that stage. But I think from 2023 onwards, when the European Tour TV rights become available, we will start to see the PGA Tour exert more influence within that. And of course, also having an ownership stake in the Ryder Cup as well. One of obviously one of the most lucrative events in the game. 
and that potentially would give the PGA Tour greater leverage with regards to the PGA of America, who of course own half the Ryder Cup as well, in trying to get a greater slice of that pie, both in terms of TV coverage and also revenue. So there's a lot going on here behind the scenes and uh, it's very interesting, but as Fred touched on there, it's a story that we're at the, the beginning of it. You know, this is something that will develop over the next two to three years and then beyond that. So we don't really know what it's going to be like at the moment. We can only speculate. But I think this is one of those stories where, yeah, it's a bit kind of boring. It's not too exciting. It's not very flashy. But when we look back five years from now, I think this strategic alliance, if you want to call it that, Ultimately, when one bigger organization comes in, it's not really an alliance. It's more of just a, a merger or a takeover, I mean, for all intents and purposes. But in five years from now, we might look back at this event as being a really, really important one for the, the professional game as a televised sport uh, in the years to come. And, you know, obviously the likes of Seve Biosteros is probably rolling in his grave thinking about the PGA Tour having its hands on the European Tour. But I think for the players, for the viewers. Uh, I, I think it will probably at some point um, be a positive move. And I say in the years to come, we will see the landscape of TV golf change forever. And the PGA Tour wants to be at the forefront of that and have the most control possible. And having the P European Tour in its pocket effectively is a way to ensure they have access to international markets and greater control over the tours and the events and the players and ultimately the viewers. And obviously that gives them control over the revenue streams. So watch this space. This will develop in the years to come. It'll lead us to some very interesting places and potentially some very exciting ones. We'll see definitely. This is one that we'll continue to watch and see how it evolves. Definitely a PGA Tour. Starting something there with that strategic alliance. Now let's talk about number two. And you know, the pandemic uh, brought in lockdowns and shutdowns and social distancing and all that. But even then we started to see record numbers everywhere. And uh, we started talking about it as the as golf started to go back after the shutdowns. And Fred, I mean, is incredible. Uh, and we can attribute it to, okay, maybe it was because they didn't play or started to buy things during those three months, but definitely it, it would still be best than any other year, this record numbers that we have seen. Kieran, I think you got the lead on this. I, I do indeed. Oh, yeah, Fred sorry, is, Kieran. Fred has teed me up for that one. And, Fred, uh, I messed it up. I, I'm like, <sighs> Oh dear. I was hoping to sit out there and I tried Fred to jump in earlier, and then, but you know, it's not, no. Go ahead, take, go, go, Kieran. <laughs> well, I hope you forgive me because I, it, it, this happens occasionally, but my vocal cords are actually getting a bit stretched and a bit frayed and a bit tired, and I'm starting to lose my voice. You need a little so single to, ball there to soothe down. If I, have, if I have to pause occasionally and have a swallow, then you, you know why. But uh, yes, as you touched on there, Carlos, the coronavirus pandemic has upended lives and industries. It's affected everybody in every industry. Uh, much of that, of course, negatively. But for golf, there's been a quite staggering boom, not just in the US, but internationally. Uh, so as you say, for much of the world in, in many parts of the US, particularly in the spring, golf was shut down. You couldn't go and play. And people had that dying urge to go out and play again and get out in the fresh air and exercise and socially distance and golf is an ideal activity for these times. You're in big wide open spaces, limited access to other people, and it's a wonderful re recreation to enjoy. And um, people came to the game in huge numbers. People who already played the game played it in great numbers, but also new players and also returning players came back to golf this year in stunning numbers. So looking at numbers in the US, and this was reported earlier in the year in August by the National Golf Foundation and Golf Data Tech. And they said that total rounds played this year in the US were on pace to be up to 10% higher than they were in the previous year. So it's been a huge surge for golf courses, resorts, operators, uh, and it's been stunning. You know, because obviously people haven't had the chance to go and do other activities. We've seen indoor events banned, hospitality severely affected. There's no concerts, there's no cinemas, there's no 
there's no restaurants or they've been shut down, certainly. Team sports were harder to do for a long time. Indoor sports were harder to do. Golf became a refuge for many people and they surged to it. So actually in August, the month of August specifically in the late summer, rounds in the US were up 20% on the previous year. That's 10 million more rounds played that month than the previous August. And that is the largest year over year monthly increase since this data has been tracked over two decades ago. Staggering. At a time when people say, oh, golf, struggling golf, you know, needs to grow, it's, you know, the dying sports. The reality is the opposite. Um, so the numbers in the US were massive, incredible. And in certain states in particular, they jumped up by 40 to 50 percent. Uh, and in parts of the midsummer, they jumped up massively too. So it just shows you that uh, you know, golf has in many ways flourished in the most difficult of um, situations. And I think it underlines the, the benefits that the game can bring people uh, in terms of their physical fitness, their mental health, social interaction, uh, all this stuff. Uh, being out in, the, in nature and spending that three, four, five hours, whatever it might be, you're out there, you're shut off from the rest of the world. And it's a very soothing thing. And there's so many studies now done across the world about how beneficial golf can be for your health, both physically and mentally. And I think this year we've needed that more than any other. And people have taken the opportunity. And I say it's massive in the US, huge sur surge, and I'm a huge surge as well in equipment sales. So in August, it was reported that um, sales had increased by 32% on the previous year in the US, reaching $331 million. Massive. So for the club manufacturers, the apparel sellers, all these brands, there's a lot of money to be made at this very difficult time. So it just shows you that the opportunity was there for the game to take advantage of. And internationally, it's been the case everywhere else too. Australia, massive increase. Here in the UK, it's been unbelievable how busy golf courses have been all across the country. Um, golf came back here in late May, and it's been extraordinary, the response from the public. And we've seen so many new players and uh, returning players as well. And uh, uh, rounds by young people have been up by around 20% this year. And this, this is people under the age of 18. So kids are getting back into golf in huge numbers. And in, in the UK, we estimate that conservatively that there's approximately 100,000 100, new or returning golfers who took up the game this year. Uh, and that's a huge percentage for the, for the UK golf population. And it just underlines that there's a massive opportunity here for the game going forward. You know, yes, this is a very unique year and we hope never to repeat it again. And I'm sure some of these people who have taken up golf will go back to other activities when they're allowed to do so. But it's been a chance for the game to showcase itself and show the benefits it can bring to people physically, mentally, socially, and just the joys of the game. So hopefully this can now be facilitated into long-term growth and sustainability. It's all fine having one great year. Can you maintain that in the future? And that's gonna be the challenge for every golf industry, every golf organization and governing body at every nation, can they retain these new players and potentially take the lessons of that, what they've seen this year and try and bring more people back into the game in the years to come. So it's been a dire year in so many respects. The worst year we've you know, had in living memory for so many people, unimaginable, uh, but for golf, there's a, there's a sign there that, um, you know, it had, a, it had a positive year in the sense of new players came back to it, people came to the game for the first time, and the question is now, can we maintain that in the future, in and in hopefully a non-COVID environment? Can we ensure that the game is, is sustainable in the long term? There's a great opportunity here for, the, for golf. Uh, does it have the vision to make the most of that? That remains to be seen, but certainly this year, the response from the golf community and the wider community was inspiring for golf in every nation, in the US, in the UK, all across the world. We saw a fantastic surge in golf this year and it must have given so many people in the industry a good boost when it was needed. And obviously during some very dark times, they, they had a positive story to tell. And that's been a very welcome thing for golf going into next year.
Right, definitely. We we talked about this at large during the, the uh, post lockdown uh, golf news and uh, numbers. I mean, the numbers have been up and up and up. And uh, golf is one of one of those few sports that naturally can offer you social distancing. So it's the perfect sport to battle this pandemic that we're that we're living in. So tell us a bit a little bit about that rise in the golf numbers this year. Well, yeah, once golf got the green light, uh, everyone around the world started swinging a golf club and chasing a little white ball. It was something they could do: keep a safe distance, get out of their house, and be active. Equipment manufacturers were selling at record pace in July, August, and September. We can only hope these numbers can continue at even. 75% of the current numbers. Uh, the one segment uh, of the industry, of the golf industry that has been hurt due to the pandemic is golf travel. Resorts are only able to take uh, like 30 to 50% of their capacity. Um, and uh, many golfers are choosing to drive to golf destinations rather than fly. So it takes out the long distance traveler. Uh, this also has then an um, impact on the food and beverage sales, as well as their green fees and lodging. Now, a lot of resorts are doing great drive-in business. Uh, for example, French Lick, they had a fantastic summer. Once they got going, uh, people, you know, they're, they're in the middle of St. Louis, Nashville, uh, Indianapolis, Cincinnati. Uh, you could even draw from Chicago there. So they had a lot of drive-in business, and, and so they had a great, great summer. Uh, places down in Florida who are looking to have big winters, um, you know, people aren't traveling as much. So they're not going down there and, and they might be struggling a little bit. A, a lot of a lot of the uh, resorts that I deal with uh, are just aren't having the numbers that they would normally have. So as golf industry as a whole has done very well, guys, the golf travel and the resort business has not has been hurt and not done as well. Yeah, and definitely, if you look at it from the National Golf Foundation, I have some numbers here that I'm going to read to you. In October, the rise in rounds played in 2020 is almost 11% ahead of last year's pace. So play increasing uh, continued in October with the national rounds jumping by 32.2% over the year ago. The industry is now 10.8% ahead of last year's pace. Despite losing 20 million rounds in the spring due to the coronavirus, only one state has seen drops in the in the rounds played uh, since the pandemic, and that is Hawaii. Which goes to your point, Fred. Uh, it's difficult because you have to travel there, and uh, there's been being an island and them being so far away. It's not being easy for them to 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 recuperate that to recuperate that, but. Uh, Definitely nice numbers that we're seeing here. There's a record $1 billion golf equipment sales in Q3. Okay, the retail sales top $1 billion in total for the months of July, August, and September, which is an all-time Q3 record since Golf Data Tech started this, collecting this information in 1997. So overall, we have seen that uh, entering August, there was already 98% of US golf courses open for play. When we were talking about it in April, it was only 44%. So it, that enables a lot of these numbers also to help. So even in the pandemic uh, year and all that, we have seen a growth in numbers. Now I just, let's see if it keeps it that way, going into a maybe safer 2021. Hopefully we can get some of those numbers to retain that that same momentum that the golf industry has gained, but uh, like everything else, time is at the essence and that will be what it's left to see. Now, it's time for the mysterious, <laughs> unknown, Wrong. number one. We have been keeping this secret. I mean, <laughs> it's been under wraps. I have not shown anyone because this is a big surprise right now. It's the first time we're gonna talk about this subject this year even though it's the number one, okay? Here it is, COVID-19 coronavirus impact in golf. No, surely not. Well, I don't surprising. believe it. Surprising. I, I, it's, I know, I know. I'm sorry I shocked you guys. We're shocking the world with this piece of news. Um, 
I, I don't know. I mean, we, we, it's, they had to be talked about. I know nobody has talked about it, but uh, Fred, let's start with you. What does the COVID-19 pandemic meant uh, for you, the impact in golf this year? Well, that's a good question. What does it all mean? You know, we talked about a lot of different topics in and around COVID already tonight. And it just touches every part of your life, right? And golf is one of those things that it's touched everything. So it's by far the biggest and most important topic in golf of 2020 and probably will be for the next 10 years or maybe longer. I don't, who knows what will come down the road, but this has been in my lifetime. Um, you know, I, I, I was talking to somebody the other day, you know, I, the older guys older than me, you know, they had World War II and they had Korea. Before that, there was a depression uh, for my grandparents' era, um, you know, and we never really had that. Yeah, we had the Vietnam War and, and uh, you know, we had the uh, racial uh, unrest in the 70s, 60s and 70s and things like that. But we've never really had that big major uh, upheaval. And so this is kind of uh, that major event in my lifetime that uh, just kind of overpasses or surpasses everything. So anyhow, in March, um, when the stuff really hit the fan, my wife and I had just returned to Ohio from an eight-week, 8,000-mile odyssey that took us from Ohio to Florida, across the south, into Texas, New Mexico, and Arizona. We didn't encounter any problems, but when we returned home, we decided to head to northern Michigan and get away from the high COVID numbers and risk that were in the greater Toledo area. I've only traveled three times uh, this year uh, since March, once to Boyne, to Firestone Country Club and to French Lick. And all of those three occasions, I did not feel threatened or at risk. Courses everywhere are seeing record numbers playing every day of the week. Golf courses and resorts have learned to use new sanitation protocols and keep the safety of their guests at the forefront. As we mentioned, the previous section, golf retail sales are at an all-time high. Local golf operators are seeing full tee sheets with golfers paying full rate and buying beer and food while they're there. It's a windfall for the golf course owners like they have not seen for decades. Golf is a perfect antidote for self-quarantining. You can play by yourself, stay socially distant, and still be outside getting exercise and fresh air. As I've said on the show several times, I am so proud of the golf industry as a whole in leading the fight to stay active and not bend to this dastardly foe. Every course I have visited and every owner operator I have talked to has taken this very seriously and is doing everything they can to make and keep golf safe and enjoyable for every golfer, guys. Most definitely, we have to agree with that. Uh... I I will tell my, my story later, but Kieran, how about what you've seen uh, from the era perspective also? Uh, we know exactly what's going on here, but this is a worldwide phenomenon. And we yeah. talked about this off air before we, we started recording. So uh, it's the first thing that we've ever seen in our lifetime that has really affected the whole world. Mm -hmm. uh, so how, how do you see the impact that was there and especially in golf? Yeah, I mean, it's, I think, yeah, you're correct in saying that. And we discussed it earlier about how it is the one event that has affected everybody, every country, every person has been touched by this in some degree or another. And that is very unique. I mean, I'm not sure there's been an event in history that actually can reflect that. Even World War II didn't touch every single person on Earth. Um, it touched a lot of people, but this is everybody. This is all, all four corners of the globe. And... And given the nature of international travel and the way that the world now is a much smaller place, effectively, uh, we haven't had even previous pandemics did not affect every single corner of the globe. This has. And it is the defining event of this century, this generation, you can, whatever adjective you want to use. And therefore, it has touched every part of our lives in one way or another. And golf's obviously been part of that. So you can't really quantify it because... You obviously, you know, what is golf? Is it the guys on tour or is it the regular golf clubs? Well, it's all part of the story. And on tour, we've seen, obviously, it's impacted through the, 
scheduling, lack of events, lack of fans. We haven't even discussed that tonight. Lack of crowds at golf tournaments, a huge loss and sporting events worldwide. Um, no Open Championship this year. That was a huge miss. Um, first time I've seen that since the Second World War. And that shows you kind of the, the times that we're living in. And so on a professional golf level, it was a unique and it's had a major impact and one that will continue into the years to come. On a regular golf level, as Fred touched on, you know, the average golf course for course operators, we've seen that huge boom in golf participation numbers, which is very encouraging. And again, golf showing itself in a really positive light, which has been very heartwarming to see. Again, as Fred also touched on, golf travel has been massively impacted. So I can only really relate this to my own experiences here in St. Andrews, um, which is also a unique town in the sense that it's kind of an international beacon for golf and is as close as golf has to a capital city. And here we have massive international tourism. It's huge in so many respects. One, we have a university here that has a huge international student base, one that has gratefully returned to their studies uh, this year and has done so largely safely, which has been very pleasing and very encouraging. But from a golf perspective, we have so many visitors here from the US, from Japan, from Australia, South Africa, from all over the world. Since I've lived here, I've literally played with people from every single continent on earth, apart from Antarctica, that I know of. I haven't met many Eskimos since I've been here, but otherwise I've, I've got them all covered. Chinese, Almost Australian. penguins, but no Eskimos. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> yeah. Um, we, actually do, we actually do have penguins here. There's a St. Andrew's Aquarium and penguins do actually live here and you can actually adopt them but that's another story for another day but um they're good putters I... they're very good not so good with the long game but they're good putters they're very good putters yes i quite agree good touch around the greens but um but yeah so all, all corners of the globe they come here it is a wonderful cosmopolitan town basically this very small town on the east coast of scotland there's this international beacon and when we get into lockdown on march 23rd was when that happened and everything shut down that was it everything stopped almost overnight and it was ghostly at times um we didn't have any of the international visitors there was no americans there was no no japanese no chinese no australians no europeans there was just nothing and i remember walking down and this was in early may so this is actually before golf came back here golf came back here i think on may 29 in scotland and i walked down to the old course which is obviously a monument for the game and you know hundreds of thousands of people come here every single year and there's tens of thousands of rounds played there every year and the course was empty all the hotels were closed there was not a single soul it was so quiet and this was in may when the season is really beginning to ramp up and it really made it hit home just what had happened because when you're in your house when you're at home nothing changes you're, you're obviously you're spending more time at home but it's still your home you're used to that environment you don't really appreciate what's happened until you venture beyond that and you see the world and what's going on outside it and for me walking down the links that day and seeing how quiet it was when normally it would be buzzing wonderfully atmospheric it's a wonderful town to be in in the season and that life wasn't there and I found that quite sobering at the time and we've seen a little bit of an upsurge at times this year and it has got busier particularly with uh, British travellers, which is slightly unique. It's very much an international destination nowadays, but a lot of British people came here from all across the country, but it was never quite the same. And for me, that was hit home just how impactful this has been for everybody. And again, it will be the defining event, hopefully, of our lifetimes. And we never want to see this repeated again. Hopefully lessons have been learned in many respects by all governments. <laughs> And all people, of course, I, you know, the cynic in me would think that's not actually going to be the case. But, you know, hopefully, you know, be an optimist for once and think possibly we can learn from this. But, you know, I don't know, there's enough evidence to suggest that won't actually happen. But I hopefully we take everyone learns from this year in some way or another. They learn to appreciate the simple things, the things that we all took for granted um, that hopefully we'll have the chance to enjoy again next year and in the years to come. And we will appreciate those simple things again. I will, I can't wait for the day. And I never thought I would say this. 
I can't wait for the day when I walk down the old course and all I hear are American accents and Japanese people talking. That's I, I, I long for that day because it brings so much you know, colour to this place. And uh, without that this year, it's been quite sobering. And, um, and for me, that sight of golf's cathedral, if you like, being empty during the season, that for me was uh, the moment that everything just hit home. Um, you, you can't get that feeling watching the news or, or reading newspapers. You can get a sense of what's happening, but until you see it for yourself, it, you remain somewhat detached from it. But I saw it that day and it just underlined how this terrible, terrible thing has impacted everybody. Um, so hopefully, you know, fingers crossed that uh, we can have better times next year. You know, people talk about the new normal. I want the old normal back. I want that back. I want what we had before back. And this year has both flown by and also felt like an eternity. Time is, is gone. It's just all over the place. And um, yeah, hopefully we can have better times and we can have those visitors back here to St. Andrews and we can actually get a feel of what golf in this town and, and what people in, what, why people come here and what, why they take so much away from it. And uh, it's been very empty without that. Um, so hopefully we can see that, that change in the near future because uh, I've certainly missed uh, the old normal uh, during this uh, very strange year. Yeah, you know, I can't wait. This is what I will remember for the rest of my, for, for the rest of my days, really having to wear a mask daily. Can't wait until the day that I can just get out and be back like this, <laughs> you know. Uh, definitely has affected people that I know, um, family, friends, uh, everywhere. And uh, in golf specifically, I mean, you guys have mentioned everything that we have seen. It's been something like anything else we will, I don't know if we will ever see something like this. I hope we don't. Uh, definitely, I mean, Fred, you've with your classes uh, during the year, of course, it's affected you as well. Uh, just as it has affected any other professional in golf. Um, I hopefully 2021 will be a more positive and we can just look back and say, hey, that was the year that we all wear masks, wear with hand sanitizers all the time. Um, and uh, it's gone. The, I really look forward to that. Hopefully we can just make it history like it, like it was. This was the year of the coronavirus, but 2021 is just look forward to greater and better things. I mean, after 2020, 20, anything will be better just if we improve it a little bit without it. So let's start now. That's our 10 stories of the year, plus our two honorable mentions. Uh, we covered it be, below the two hours, so we still have a little bit of time so I'm going to give you guys a chance to tell me what are you looking most forward to 2021? Kieran, you go first. <laughs> well, uh, quite simply, I hope that 21 brings better times. Uh, I do suspect that we have a still have a long way to go on a, a bumpy road, um, but hopefully the coming year will at least bring some light on the horizon. That's how I kind of sum it up. But I've got to say, just on a slightly different note, you mentioned the face masks there. I've actually got quite, I'm quite a fan of the face masks. And I'll tell you why, because if you wear the face mask and you go to the supermarket, you can go in there and you can be basically anonymous. People don't know who you are. It means you can avoid people you, you see and you don't particularly like. You can avoid the perils and the horrors of small talk, which I hate, I hate. <laughs> I hate it. So recluse. <laughs> I'm a recluse at heart. Well, I'm not really. I just, I just, I just quite, I quite, I, well, my running joke this year has been that uh, everybody else is just catching up to me. I was into social isolation before it was fashionable. And this is it. So I was, everyone else is doing the same thing I've been doing for years. But, um, but no, I quite like the face mask. So, you know, maybe I might do it for the next five years. But uh, yeah, and hand sanitizers, you know, I'm, I'm up for that too. But, Yes. Let me, let, me, let me tell you one thing before you keep going about that, about the mask, because it's yes. important. You know, to me, I have this syndrome. Uh, whenever I, I'm in the car and I have to get it put on, 
And if it's a bank or something, I feel like I'm going to rob it or something. I feel like I'm putting my mask. Uh, oh, man, I feel so bad because I think that I'm going to rob a bank by doing that, you know, and it's not, it's not right. Or just go to the supermarket. I feel like, especially now in the winter that you just put your hoodie on also. I mean, it's just, I can't, I can't. I have to take it off. I have to take it off. But anyway, I, I, just making that joke there. But yeah, I, I, th I think it's more that, I think it's more what the mask represents. I think. I mean, it's it's not a hardship really to put one on, go into places, but it's what, it's what it represents in that we're it's a reminder of the situation that we're all in, and um, and I think that's why people have an issue with it at times. But uh, no, I, I quite like it. I think it's it's quite good. I mean, I, I'm not against it entirely. So yeah, I, I, I could I could see myself in five years' time being the one person on the bus wearing a mask. That, that could be me. And um, mind you, that's <laughs> people would know who I am then. So maybe not. Uh, but uh, yeah, so uh, yeah, I think generally speaking, we hope next year will bring better times. What I look forward to seeing, first of all, in terms of golf, is I would love to see fans back at golf tournaments again in relatively sizable numbers. Um, I, I don't necessarily miss the, the getting the whole man and the Baba Booey and all this stuff, but I think particularly for the big championships, I think they are heightened and enhanced by the crowds. And I think we did miss them this year. I think the Masters and the US Open and the PGA particularly, while they were great events and you know, fantastic champions, great performances, there was a, a slight element of it, it felt too low-key. Players need to feel that intensity that the crowd bring, the atmosphere offers, and we missed that this year. So hopefully when we get towards Augusta in April for the, the next Masters, uh, which is coming around very quickly, we can see some semblance of fans being back there and uh, offering a degree of an atmosphere. So what I hope ultimately is at the end of next year, not looking too far ahead now, because we have to appreciate day by day, that's certainly become apparent this year. At the end of next year, COVID-19 or whatever it might be called at that point, isn't story number one. Even if it's Bryson DeChambeau, as long as it isn't COVID we're talking about next year, I'll be delighted. So hopefully we have a better year to come for everybody because see this has touched everyone to varying degrees. So we all want to get back to something like normal, and um, you know, and that will be a magical day. It won't happen overnight. It'll be a progressive journey. You know, it'll happen step by step. But uh, say hopefully we can see that light on the horizon, and if we can get closer to that by the end of next year, and be able to enjoy the things we love, whether it be you know traveling for golf, seeing our family and our friends connecting with others, going to events, uh, whatever it might be, if we feel we can do that again safely and freely, uh, that'll be magical. So my hope for next year isn't about a specific event or a specific tournament or anything like that. It's just that I hope we see some light on the horizon. And uh, that's how I would, in, it would, I would end our review of this year going into next year. I know that Brett Polkoff, uh, Bryson DeChambeau's agent, uh, heard this and heard um, he heard uh, Fred saying that why this wasn't the, the biggest story. And he now listens to you saying the next year you prefer it to be Bryson. Brett, Bryson, I'm sorry. We'll, we'll take it to management for next year. We'll, 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 we'll talk even more about you. Don't worry about it. But every, anyway, Fred, how about 2021 what are you well, just real quickly for me i hate the mass i absolutely hate everything about it uh it, it's just a symbol to me of shutting me off from the rest of the world i want to see people's faces i want to see their reactions um I, I don't like it in any shape or form i i absolutely hate them um they are a, a necessity and i do them but but i absolutely hate it and uh the, the only other thing comment i want to make is just that uh and we've said this before, uh, doing this show with you guys is so much fun. I, I look forward to it so much. And we've been able to go through 2020, do this stuff. We never had a shutdown, Carlos. So uh, we, uh, we did every week. We were, we were in there talking about something. There was still something to talk about. And uh, we enjoyed doing it. Kieran, you bring so much to the show when you come on. And uh, we just, uh, we love it. This wraps up uh, 2020. We'll be wrapping up the eighth year at the, the week of the Masters in April. We'll be starting our ninth year of doing this. And uh, 
we just have a good time doing it. We hope the, the people that listen enjoy it and uh, get something out of it. Love the stuff we covered tonight, guys. And uh, so another great job. So thanks a lot. Yeah, with this, uh, definitely for 2021, I look forward to the build up. I don't think that because of the lockdown, we were able to do build up stories to the Masters or to any of the big tournaments or any of the storylines that we usually build up to it. Now, I think that with the normal schedule playing up, we will be able to to start doing that in 2021. That might be the biggest thing that I want. I'm looking forward. And again, not wearing the mask. But anyway, uh, Kieran Clark, definitely we appreciate you. We enjoy every single second that you're with us. Uh, Thank you. Being all three here is an amazing, amazing thing. Uh, we're looking, we look forward all the time to, to have you. So we thank you for your, for your contributions as well. Fred, thank you for being there and, uh, you know, accepting me for eight years so far. So hopefully we can do some, <laughs> some more. You put up with me. <laughs> no, it's not easy. No, it's not easy, but hey. You still you have stuck around with there with me, so I appreciate you, man. And and thank you also for your words uh, and to you, Kieran, also via email. Last week was a very difficult one for me. 2020, not only I will remember it for um, the COVID, but my dad passed away uh, last Saturday, so it's been a tough, challenging week. So I appreciate both of you reaching out to me and and you know and saying your words uh i really appreciate it so anyway back niners this wrap up the year of 2020 the recap show on um, back nine report we'll we're gonna see you the first tuesday on youtube of next year so don't don't miss us okay have a happy holidays and have make 2021 be the best year that you've ever had so happy golfing everybody we'll see you on the back nine until next year. <laughs>